Hi everyone, this is Glennis Morgan from ShootPaddles.com. Welcome to the third video in my exposure series. In videos one and two, I gave you some insight into how to get better photos by understanding the exposure triangle. In video one, you met the histogram and how it can help you get the best exposure for your image. Then in video two, you learned about shutter speed and just a little bit about ISO. Today, in video three, you'll get comfortable with your camera's aperture. One more very important concept that once you understand it, will change your photography forever. Here's a short refresher on the three parts of the exposure triangle. First, your ISO is your exposure enabler. ISO dictates how sensitive your film or your camera sensor is to light and you can adjust it right in your DSLR camera or if you shoot film you'll buy a film with a specific ISO rating. Next shutter speed or how fast or slow your shutter opens and closes to let a very specific amount of light into your camera. Your shutter speed has to be fast to freeze motion like sports for instance or Use a slow shutter speed to blur motion. A good example of deliberate blurring is when you photograph a beautiful waterfall to make it look ethereal. What exactly does the aperture do? This might help you understand. My friend's son is celebrating a birthday today and his parents are throwing a pool party for him. I volunteered to fill up the two kids' pools in the backyard with water. And for the first one, I'm going to use a half-inch rubber tube. And the other one, I'll use a fire hose. Which one's going to fill up the pool the fastest? Oh, there's no surprise there. The fire hose wins hands down. That's exactly how shutter speed and aperture work together. If you wanted the same amount of light, from both a wide and a tiny aperture, you'd have to let the light through the smaller aperture for a longer time. See, you can change either time, shutter speed, or the size of the opening, aperture, in many ways to get the same end result. And you need a result that gives you the image you want. So what's depth of field, or DOF, this is a concept you need to understand so you can make an image look like you actually planned the result. A camera can only focus on a tiny area at a time, just like your eyes. Try this. Look at something right in front of you. Focus on it. Stay focused and try to bring your entire field of view into focus in front and behind. Can't do it, can you? Me neither. That's another similarity between your camera lens and your eyes. Depth of field is the area in front and behind the spot your camera focuses on that's going to appear sharp. The transition from what's in focus to what's blurry is gradual. Aha! Do you see the creative possibilities here? So many things can affect your depth of field. It changes with different lenses, for instance, different brands, the type of lens and the quality of the lens, or different focal lengths. Do you have a wide angle, a normal lens, macro, telephoto? Then there's the aperture you choose. Your camera sensor size, and there are several. Also, the depth of field changes drastically with how close or how far away you are from what you're focusing on. So you could be maybe five miles away from a beautiful mountain landscape, or are you um, sitting right up on top of the grasshopper that you're looking at through a macro lens? Uh, those are extremes, of course. Here's a great example of a narrow depth of field. Uh, this little red camera's lens is obviously what we're supposed to look at. The area that is in focus is a really narrow slice. The camera body and the background are blurred, 
and our eyes go straight to the lens because it's the only element that's in sharp focus in this photo. Your eyes are a lot like your camera lens. The circular colored part called the iris has muscle tissue that contracts to open up the eye when it's uh, not getting enough light to see properly. And we call that dilation. When the brain says we need less light, the muscle relaxes and the pupil, the opening in the middle, gets smaller. We say that the pupil constricts. So doesn't that sound a lot like the aperture in your lens? How we see is a complicated electrochemical process and it happens without thinking about it. Cameras are electronic and we can put the process on auto. Then the camera's brain, which is really pretty flimsy compared to yours, adjusts the aperture, ISO, and the shutter speed. But it's different from our eyes because we can take over control of the aperture adjustment, shutter speed, and ISO on our cameras if we want to. Now from eyes to apertures. The aperture is built into the lens, not the camera body. The aperture works with your shutter speed to regulate the amount of light reaching the sensor. I erase the mirrors and the shutter here just to make it easier for you. Changing your lens will most likely change your range of apertures. Uh, this particular lens has the widest aperture of f1.4 and the smallest is f16. My favorite lens is from 2.8 to 32. So here's the concept. Just like your eyes, the aperture adjusts the size of the hole that light flows through. Need more light? Open up the aperture. Too much light? Choose a smaller aperture. Well, this is a little puzzling. It doesn't really make much sense, does it? Isn't 16 much larger than 1.4? Yes, it is. Remember when we talked about shutter speed being a fraction? And it's just understood that 125 is really 1 one twenty-fifth of a second. Well, it's the same with apertures. 2 or 1 over 2 is half a pi, right? A half. If you go to f4, that converts to a quarter. And see right here? Sure enough, a quarter is a half of a half. So it's smaller. An eighth is a half of a quarter. So it's twice as small as a half. Oh gosh, don't worry, math wasn't my strongest subject either. Check this cute trick to remember all your major f-stops. Look at every second f-stop. Let's start at 1.4. Multiply it by 2, skip a stop, and voila, there's 2.8. Multiply 2.8 by 2, and leapfrog over the next stop, we got 5.6. Once again, alrighty, we got 11. Yes, I know it should be 11.2, but hey, close enough. Most cameras are going to have F22 as well. Neat trick, huh? And that goes for the stops in between. F2 times 2, 4. And 4 times 2, 8. And we end up with 16. And of course, some cameras have F32. Now, depending on your camera, you may be able to program it for a half stops as well as a third stops. If you do that, you'll see three numbers between each of the major stops. You'll see a stop, a third stop, a half stop, a two-third stop, and then your next full stop. I set my camera to use half stops, but not the third stops. These pretty peonies are all in focus, but compare the backgrounds in them. I'm very close to the plant, uh, so the depth of field is really narrow. F5.6 is a very wide aperture, and the depth of field is much slimmer than F22. So the first image has a blurry background. 
but f22 is such a tiny aperture with such a deeper depth of field so the background is also in focus f11 is somewhat sharp I choose an even larger aperture like 2.8 to really blur out the background for an artistic photo. Here's a little secret about lenses. The aperture in the middle of the range gives the sharpest image. If we look at the same lens again, you'll see that the best possible focus at I is either at um, f4 or f5.6 with a lens that has a range from say f2.8 to f22 the sharpest aperture would be f8 and another tip with the tiniest apertures you'll get light diffraction and that just means that light scatters in all directions so as your aperture gets smaller your images won't be tack sharp I rarely use f32 this is an iPhone 5s photo but with a twist. I used an Oloclip macro lens here and this is a clamshell and my lens is only an inch or so away from it. Remember that your depth of field gets smaller the closer you get to your subject. Well this shell is only two inches in length and you can see how quickly the focus falls off. I focused on the edge of the shell. In all macro photography, it's really important that you have a tripod to keep your camera still. The tiniest movement will knock your focus right off. With this brilliant red and white tulip focuses on the edge of the petals closest to me. Okay, F16 has a wide depth of field, but the lens is so close, maybe about 18 inches away from the flower. So the depth of field is quite reduced. Even at f16, look how quickly the sharpness drops off. This is a 70 to 300 telephoto lens at 300 millimeters. So on my camera, it's 450 millimeters. I'm staying back from the butterfly so I don't scare it away. Because I'm 10 feet away, I can get more in focus now. F11 is my sharpest aperture and it's perfect for capturing the daylily and the butterfly. And the background is blurred just the way I wanted. The butterfly inside the daylily is basically a portrait, just like this photo of my niece. With a portrait, always focus on the eyes. If you don't get the eyes clear and sharp, a portrait just doesn't look right. And that goes for people and animals as well. F5.6 keeps my knee sharp and the background out of focus. My effective lens here was 300 millimeters and my shutter speed was 1 350th because she's full of energy, always on the go. And 1 350th will stop any of her motion. Every photo tells a story, like these portraits of my friends. Uh, they love to be outdoors, and you know that because of what they're wearing and the backgrounds are clear enough to make out that they're out in nature. And speaking of being out in nature, what apertures do you think are best for landscapes? First, you have to get to know your own lens and how your depth of field changes with your changing f-stop. You can create whatever look you like for your landscape, but I'll show you typical landscape photos where the whole scene is in focus, front to back. This is at UBC Botanical Gardens in Vancouver. The lens is 18 to 70 millimeters and the effective length for this photo is 27 millimeters. This photo was taken at f11, the sharpest aperture on this lens. And since there wasn't much of a breeze, shutter speed was 1, 1 25th. Wide-angle lenses have a greater depth of field than, than telephoto lenses, so use a wide angle for photos of grand landscapes like this one, a flat top outside of Anchorage, Alaska. The scene is much more encompassing than the one of UBC Gardens. I used the same lens, but dialed it to 30 millimeters. On my 1.5 crop sensor, that's effectively a 45 millimeter angle of view. F8 got everything in focus from foreground to the mountains. Shutter speed was 1 250th of a second.
Here's a tip to help you with your depth of field. Go to iTunes, download an app for your iPhone or iPad, only a little more than a dollar. It's called Depth of Field Calculator. For Androids, iTunes or Mr. Google will find one for you. Or search online for a depth of field chart that you can download as a JPEG or a PDF. Print it if you want to carry it with you in your camera bag. And last but not least, use your depth of field preview button on your camera. The scene is going to look darker than what the picture will actually turn out like. When you shoot landscapes, use what's called hyperfocal distance. That means What's the closest point to me that I should focus on to make sure my foreground, middle ground, and background are all in the sharpest possible focus? You can get as technical as you want with this, and if you're interested, use your camera manual or go online and search for a good article. All I'm going to say here is focus about a third of the way into your landscape, and that should about do it. Here's wonderful Jeju Island in Korea. Jeju Island is a volcanic island or huh, a mini Hawaii. This is Black Rock Beach at the Hyatt Hotel. F8, shutter speed 190th, and 185 uh, millimeters. This is a more intimate landscape than flat top. I love that the woman's clothes exactly match the colors on the beach. If I'd wanted the water to be really sharp, I would have tried 1 500th for my shutter speed. Another smaller and more intimate landscape at Van Dusen Botanical Garden in Vancouver, my favorite place. This is a much smaller landscape than flat top. I used f16 and shutter speed of 1 30th. I don't care about my shutter speed being so slow for three reasons. First, my camera was on a tripod. Then I used a remote. And there's no wind. But Okay, what if there were a breeze and I wanted to freeze any motion? Let's figure that out. My meter told me that my perfect exposure was F16, ISO 200, and 1 30th shutter speed. Maybe I want a faster shutter speed because there's a wind, but I'm also concerned about keeping my depth of field. I want everything in focus. If I need a shutter speed of 1 250th, that's a difference of three stops of light. Losing three stops means the photo's underexposed. What can I do? Remember I called ISO the enabler? I could crank up my ISO and make it more sensitive to light, but not too much because then there might be a lot of noise in my image. The aperture's going to have to change. Let's juggle all three components. If ISO increases to 800, that's okay in my camera. I can get my shutter speed to 1 250th and only sacrifice one stop with my aperture at f11. That's no problem in this scene. Everything will still be sharp. I'll focus a third into the scene. Remember the hyperfocal distance? I try not to stray far from my sharpest apertures, but of course that's not always possible. Here though, F11 would have worked to keep everything in focus. Brilliant Japanese maple leaves make up the foreground here, and they're tack sharp because they're my subject. The evergreen trees in the middle and the background are blurred. They're blurred because they're a distance away from the maple leaves that I focused on just like I'd shoot a portrait of a person, so you could say it's a portrait of colorful leaves. All right, quiz time. When doesn't your depth of field matter? Pause me. Think hard. Okay, three, two, one. I'm back. Did you put me on pause? What's your answer? When the subject is totally flat, well, there is no depth. So a wall, uh, maybe with graffiti, a painting, or a flat rock, just like this. If you have enough light, use your optimal aperture. I did. I used F11 for both of these rocks. Pretty, aren't they? If there isn't enough light, use your widest aperture. You might have to raise your ISO. 
Whatever combinations you make in the exposure triangle, it's all good because the scene's flat. Remember from the shutter speed video that there are three auto camera modes, program, shutter priority, and aperture priority? If you decide your aperture is your most important decision, dial in aperture priority. It's the one that photographers probably use the most. Use your camera manual, set it, and forget it, because your camera will make decisions about ISO and shutter speed now. And for all typical scenes, it works well. Let's wrap this up with a few more photos. See if you understand all the choices I made. Let's start with a macro shot of a poppy. I used my Nikon 105mm macro lens at f22. I wanted the entire image in focus and my lens is inside the petals so my depth of field is very slim. That's why I chose f22 to get the maximum depth of field. This poppy was in my house and I used window light and a couple of reflectors to fill in any shadows. Shutter speed didn't matter. My camera was on a tripod and my flower was totally still. Now we're in Ketchikan, Alaska. What an incredibly rainy place. The foreground is a distance away so I used f8 and everything in the landscape is in focus. ISO 200, shutter speed 1 1 25th. So Alaska to South Korea. These are mandarin ducks on an icy winter pond. They're in the middle of the pond and I'm using the 300 millimeter lens. You can see the way the telephoto lens compresses a scene. I was far enough away to use 5.6 and get everything in focus. The ducks were quite entertaining skating along on the ice so my shutter speed was 1 2 50th to freeze any of their motion. This was on a whale watching trip off of Vancouver Island in a zodiac in February. Unless you're part polar bear, I don't recommend it. I thought I'd never thaw out, but I did get some totally awesome photos. I used my 300 millimeter lens and I'm far enough away to use f5.6 and get the sea lines and the rocks they're on in focus. I needed a fast shutter speed because they were bobbing back and forth, barking away and occasionally one would jump into the water. I needed 800 ISO so I could get that fast shutter speed. A crisp cold winter picture in Manitoba, Canada with all the beautiful hoarfrost on the trees and the moon in the morning sky. F8 and F11 are my middle range apertures on this lens. Now to Bouchard Gardens on Vancouver Island. This is the dining room. The window light is gorgeous and it floods into the whole restaurant. With F8, everything in the windowsill and outside in the private gardens in focus. Back to Korea. This is a very colorful group of traditional dancers. They don't stand still for very long and I was worried they were going to start dancing again. But I managed to catch them still for a few minutes. Wonderful, rich, bright colors. And the girls are standing on the same plane right across the frame of the photo. I didn't need a large depth of field to get everything in focus. F4.2 was good and it gave me a high enough shutter speed just in case they suddenly jumped into action. Wow, that was a lot of information I just hit you with in the last 24 minutes. So it's time for you to get some serious practice in now. And I'll talk to you again soon.